Okay, so today we're talking about infinity for the first time, and in particular, we're going to be talking about countably infinite sets. And uh, make sure that you read, as is, as is written here and on the calendar, um, Logic and Proof section 22.2 .2 and um, Fundamentals of Higher Mathematics section 15 before you watch this lecture. Okay, so um, here we have our first definition already written out. Uh, if we have two sets A and B, and we have a bijection B from A to B, we say that A and B have the same cardinality in that case, and we write, uh, let's say, bar A equals bar B. So this is very similar to um, the last lecture about finite cardinality. All right, and now um, we're interested in things being countably infinite, and so we say that a set is countably infinite if it is in bijection or if it, if it has a bijection between itself and n. But using the vocabulary of the previous definition, we can say if it has the same cardinality as n. Okay, so that's what it means for a set to be countably infinite. And we say that a set is countable oops, is countable if it is either finite or countably infinite. So countable includes both finite and countably infinite. Okay, so here's a very simple example. Of course, since the natural numbers is in bijection with itself, it has the same cardinality as itself, because the identity function from n to n is, of course, a bijection. n is countable. It's, in particular, countably infinite. But you probably already knew that it was infinite, but now we can say that it's countable. Okay, so here's the first interesting theorem. If we take two copies of n and put them together in this way that I'll explain in a second, that's also countable, or in particular, countably infinite. And we haven't seen this symbol before, but um, it's not a far stretch from what we have seen. So let me just explain it. So this upside down is an upside down um, pi, the Greek character pi. Um, so this is a disjoint union. It means that we're taking the disjoint union, which is very similar to taking the union, but what we do is we take, since we're taking the union of two things that are the same, if we took the normal union of them, if we took the normal union of n and n, we would just get back n. But we're taking the disjoint union, meaning that we want to think of them as two um, copies of n, so two different copies of n. So we duplicate n to get two copies, and then we take the union. So you would think that this guy, this set n, n disjoint union n, has twice as many elements as n, which is a good intuition, but we'll see that basically twice as many of a countably infinite set is still a countably infinite set. And we can imagine um, n disjoint union n to be written in this way. So we have a set of 0, 1, 2, all these natural numbers, but also another copy of the natural numbers. So let's just um, make another copy that is basically the same, but um, seems a little bit different by putting a prime on all these numbers to just differentiate them a little bit. So we have a set here of two, um, two of each natural number. Okay, so we want to say that this uh, set, where we take two copies of the natural numbers and put them together, is still countably infinite. It doesn't really get any bigger than the natural numbers itself. So let's see why that's true. 
And I'm not going to give a full proof. I'm just going to give a proof sketch of this fact. And a proof sketch, um, as is suggested by the name, I don't think we've, we've done this before in the class, is um, something approaching a proof, but it's missing a lot of details. So it's just trying to communicate the key idea of the proof, and the details can hopefully easily be filled in by the reader. But most of these proofs um, are in uh, at least Logic and Proof, the textbook. So um, I would suggest that you look there to see the actual proof. That will also be an important thing to understand. But this lecture is just to kind of distill the main idea and, and communicate that. Okay, so here's the proof sketch. We're going to define a function because of course if we're saying that something is countably infinite, that means we have to produce a bijection um, between n, disjoint union n, and n. So we want to produce a bijection and first of all we're just going to describe the function. So uh, we're going to describe a function f from n to n disjoint union n by letting f of n for each n, f of n is going to be n over 2 if n is even and it's going to be n minus 1 over 2 prime if n is odd. So I'm using the, just to be clear, this prime here is uh, the same as this prime here. So it's just a proof sketch. I'm just giving you a, a vague idea of what's going on. And so um, the picture we should have in our head is that we, um, whenever we have a function from n to any set, uh, maybe I can write that over here. So if we have any function from n into any set, let's call that set x, we can think of this in a lot of different ways. So first we can just think of it as a function from n to x. We can also think of it as a sequence, which you're probably very used to thinking about um, in calculus. So if we have a function like that, then it will give us all these elements. So it will give us f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, f of 4, which is exactly the same data as you give someone when you give them a sequence, like you, you um, do computations within calculus. So a function out of the natural numbers is exactly the same thing as a sequence. And um, another way to think about it, which is just more uh, intuitive, is to think if you have uh, a set x here and you've got some elements, we can think of the function f as kind of counting through these elements. So say this is f of 0, so first we get that guy, and then f of 1, maybe it's that guy, and then say f of 2 is this guy, so then we go there, and say this is f of 3, so then we go there, etc. So we can kind of think of um, a function from the natural numbers as giving us a way to count through the elements of x. And that's why we say that um, a set that's in bijection with n is countably infinite, because uh, if you have such a bijection, then of course, first of all, you have a function. So that will give you a way to count through all of the elements. Um, since, it's, since you won't hit any, you won't count any element twice because it's by definition injective, then it will be infinite, right? Because n is infinite. And it won't be any bigger than n because we will have gotten all of the guys in x once we're done counting through using our bijection. So that's the intuition uh, behind what's happening. And let's think about how that's working with our function f here. So let's go up here to our um, kind of picture of n union n. And so uh, if we look at f, f of 0, since 0 is even, is going to be 0 over 2, which is 0. So first we're going to go here. And then f of 1 is 1 minus 1 over 2, which is 0 prime. So then we go to this guy here. And then um, if we look at f of 2, that's 1. f of 3 is 1 prime. f of 4 is 2. f of 5 is 2 prime. So we're counting through the elements of this set this way. And you can see that we're going to get each of them once. 
so it's surjective, and we're gonna get um, we're not gonna ca get we're not gonna count any guys more than once, so it's injective. So that's not really a proof, but uh, hopefully it still convinces you enough that you could easily write down a um, very complete formal proof. So we're just gonna make a note here that this function f that we've just described is a bijection. Okay, so now we have um, a similar uh, statement. So let's say that the first statement that we just proved n disjoint union n is countably infinite. That's kind of like saying that, um, or is in a very real sense, like saying that n, the countably infinite plus countably infinite equals countably infinite. And now we're going to say that countably infinite times countably infinite is still countably infinite. So n times n is still countably infinite. And again, we're going to give a proof sketch. And um, this one, I'm just going to draw a picture because it is uh, for this one, it is, of course, will be possible to give a formula and prove that it's a bijection, but it's actually um, surprisingly long-winded to write down um, an actual formula. So just like um, we can write, uh, or we can imagine r times r, r squared, uh, to be illustrated by a Cartesian plane, we can also illustrate n times n, n squared, in a, a kind of plane. So. We just have all of the integer points or natural number points here. These are all the points in n times n. So for example, this guy is 0, 0, and this guy is 5, 4 here. This guy here is 5, 4, and so on and so forth. So we can. Um, draw a picture at least of n times n. And now we want to give a function, or we want to at least draw a suggestion of a function from n to n times n. And like I was saying before, we should can think about that as um, kind of tracing through all the elements of n times n one by one, counting through them. And we can easily see how that's done in this picture. So first we um, get zero comma zero, and then we get these two guys and then we get these three guys, and then we get these four guys, and so on and so forth. And you can see that um, if we keep doing this, we will eventually hit all of the points of n times n, and uh, we won't hit any one of them twice. So let me just be clear about what we're doing. So we're first counting 0, 0. Then we're here counting. Um, 1, 0, and then we're here counting 0, 1, and then we're here counting 0, 2, and then 1, 1, and then um, 2, 0, and so on and so forth. Then we count this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. Okay? And so there we have um, at least a picture of a function from n to n times n that's believably a bijection, and you can think about how um, to write a formula for that, but it's actually um, a bit more complicated than you might expect. Okay, so an important fact that we've, I've kind of been taking for granted, but will be especially useful um, coming up, is that the relation of having the same cardinality, so let's just write this in a very slapdash way, having the same cardinality, quote unquote, is an equivalence relation. So if A has the same cardinality as B, and B has the same cardinality as C, then C should have the same cardinality as A, and so on and so forth. So the idea of the proof is just that um, we have reflexivity of this relation because every identity function Oops. Every identity function we know, it's easy to check, is a bijection. So that means if we have a set A, then we look at the identity from A to A, that's a bijection, so A has the same cardinality as A. 
The inverse of any bijection is a bijection. It's basically because being a bijection is the same thing as having an inverse. So if you look at the inverse, then its inverse is the original guy. So that's still a bijection. And that means that if A has the same cardinality as B, then B has the same cardinality as A. And for um, transitivity, we have the fact that bijections compose. So if you have a bijection from A to B and one from B to C, then you get a bijection from A to C. So you can say that those guys have the same cardinality. Okay, so let's use this to prove the following theorem. The set of integers z is countable, or in particular, countably infinite. Of course, it's infinite, but it's interesting to say that it's countably infinite, so it's in bijection with n. And the proof sketch, just the idea, is that there is a pretty evident bijection from n union n to the integers. Okay, so then that bijection will say that n union n has the same cardinality as z, and we know um, that n union n already, we saw that that has the same cardinality as n, so then z will have the same cardinality as n. And this bijection um, works by just observing that if we look at z, So this is z here, and n union n we wrote um, as two lines before, but now we could maybe write it in a slightly different way as, uh, maybe I won't use negative, use prime again. So three prime, two prime, one prime, zero prime, zero, one, two, three. So that's one way to depict n union n. Uh, you can see that these guys uh, look very similar. There's just this one little problem of the zero being duplicated, but that's not a problem at all. Um, otherwise, these guys look like they have exactly the same size. Okay, so that's the basic idea that n union n and z um, pretty evidently have the same size with just the, the exception of this extra zero. But of course, since we saw that um, countably infinite plus countably infinite doesn't add anything, it's still just countably infinite. Countably infinite plus one doesn't add anything, it's still just countably infinite. So the extra zero doesn't make a difference if the rest of it is countably infinite. Okay, so here's an important lemma and you'll see um, many more technical lemmas like this in the textbook and I um, encourage you to read them and understand the proofs and they will be um, necessary for some of the quizzes. But this is just one that's gonna come in handy right now. So if there is a surjection, let's say S from A to B and A is countable then B is countable. So kind of the intuition behind this is saying that if there's a projection from A to B, then B can't be any bigger than A. So B, if A is countable, then B can only be finite or um, countably infinite itself. Okay, so let's look at the proof. Again, I'm just gonna give the basic idea. The full proof is in the textbook. So if B is finite, then we're done, of course. Then it's, of course, countable. Otherwise, if B is infinite, we want to show that it's, in particular, countably infinite. So we get a composite surjection from n to b. So what's happening here is that we have this surjection 
s from a to b. That's given in the, in the problem, of course. And we know that a must be infinite because if b is infinite and there's a rejection from a to b, um, then a couldn't touch everything in b if it were just finite, so it must be infinite. So it must then be countably infinite, so there must be a bijection between n and a, and that's what um, is labeled there b. So there must be a bijection b from n to a, and in particular, that's a surjection, of course. So we're just kind of forget about the fact that it's injective and just care about the fact that it's surjective. So now we have a um, composite from n to b, and we can, as we um, talked about when we we're talking about surjections, um, compose surjections to get another surjection. So if we compose these two surjections, we're going to get a surjection from n to b. Okay, so that's how that works. Now we're going to define a new function from n to b that's not only a surjection, but is a bijection. And we're going to do this by um, just forcing it to be injective. So we're going to delete basic, basically all elements of, now let's think of S circle B, the composite of S and V, as being not really a function, but more a surjection. So let's delete all elements of the sequence S circle B if they have already appeared in the sequence. So that's the idea, and you can make that formal. Um, and let's, so then of course, um, the idea is that this is bijective. So let's just look at a, a picture, an example, to see what I mean. So say we have a sequence in the real numbers. Let's say we have square root of 2, pi, 17.53, e, pi, 0 0.0001, etc., etc. Doesn't have a discernible pattern, but it doesn't matter. So we want to, um, so say that's our sequence S circle B. We want to turn this um, into something that's just a surjection into something that is also an injection. So we're just going to delete all of the elements that have already appeared. So in this sequence, we see that um, here, by the time we get to the second pi, pi has already appeared. So we're just going to delete that out of the sequence. And then we're, we're left with, of course, a new sequence um, that's just missing that element. And uh, since this sequence is already surjective, so it already got all of the guys in B, by deleting these duplicates, of course, we will still hit all the guys in B, so it's still surjective. But by deleting the duplicates, we are just forcing the sequence to be injective, meaning that we don't duplicate any elements of the sequence. We don't get any guys in B twice. So that's the idea. Okay, so here's another useful lemma. If A and B are countably infinite, then so is A times B. And so the proof goes as follows, or the proof sketch at least. So given if we have some bijections, let's say B uh, from N to A and C from N to B, then we can define a new bijection C from um, from n times n to a times b, which takes an ordered pair m n to the ordered pair. B of M, C of N. 
So we just put the, the two bijections together to um, make the first bijection act on the first component and the second bijection act on the second component. And if we put them together like that, we get a bijection. And then of course, since n times n is countably infinite, uh, since we've given this bijection between it and a times a, uh, a times b, a times b then is countably infinite. Okay, so now using all of these lemmas, we can prove the following theorem, which I think you'll find quite surprising, which is that, of course, n is countably infinite by definition, but surprisingly, the integers are countably infinite, and now even more surprisingly, q, the set of rational numbers, is also countably infinite. All right, so here's the proof sketch. So again, I'm just gonna give the basic idea. So there is this rejection from z times z to q. Uh, let's say just that it takes mn to m over n if n is non-zero and can do anything else if n is zero, it doesn't matter. But the point is that since every integer, or sorry, if every rational number, since every rational number is of the form m over n, this function is certainly surjective. And um, by our uh, previous theorem, we know that a surjection from a countably infinite, or sorry, from our previous lemma, we know that a surjection from a countably infinite set onto um, the set that we're interested in means that the set that we're interested in is countably infinite. And we also know now, of course, that since z is countably infinite, so is z times z. So with all of these ingredients, we find that um, the surjection tells us that q must be countably infinite.